So welcome to the last leg of our journey. The last topic that we are going to cover is this fairly new and emerging field of epistemic logic essentially. So far we have worked with knowledge bases, what they say, what are the truth values, how can you derive proofs and so on. Then when we moved away from first order logic, we looked at default reasoning which said that how can you make general inferences which are gen which are true in most situations. Then we looked at event calculus which said that how can we talk about events and changing values of predicates and time of course. Now we want to talk about multi-agent scenarios in which agents have to reason about what other agents know. So that is why in our heading here we say reasoning about knowledge that it is of course you have reasoning with knowledge but you are also reasoning about what other agents know and let us uh, see because this is a very uh, commonplace situation that very often we reason about what other people know and what other people are doing and why they are doing things and so on. But we shall have a very quick tour of epistemic logic. So let us begin with a puzzle. After we have uh, looked at the references. So the references, the main references is the first one which is this book called Reasoning About Knowledge. It is about 15, 16, 17 or 18 years old by now. But there are other references also you can see essentially. So here is a puzzle that we will start with essentially. So this woman called Cheryl, she is talking to two persons Albert and Bernard and says, I have given you a different natural number. So the domain of their reasoning is the set of natural numbers starting with 0 and then going on. And you have to find out or you have to tell me who has the larger number. So that is the only input she gives and in typically these kind of puzzles you will see that the answers that other agents give also yield information which is used by uh, other agents in the field. So let us see how Albert and Bernard tackle this. Albert says I do not know, Bernard says I do not know either. Then Albert says even though you say that I still do not know and then Bernard says aha, now I know which of us has the larger number. Then Albert says in that case I know both our numbers and Bernard says and now I also know both the numbers. So the question for you is to find out what are the numbers, what are the two numbers that were given to Albert and Bernard. We will come back to this. Meanwhile, you could take a break and try and solve this question. So where there are, as I said, it is commonplace to do epistemic reasoning. And so let us look at some of the scenarios where this happens. So for example, Arun wants Vivek to know that he is giving a talk tomorrow without making Vivek feel compelled to attend. Okay. So it is about each other's thoughts. Siddharth knows that his mother knows that he has homework to do and he cannot play late in the evening. Essentially. So he is talking about what his mother knows. Sushma does not expect Sneha to call because she knows that Sneha knows that Sushma is in a meeting at noon essentially. Suresh knows that Amit knows that he is going to bid for the contract. Now what strategy should Suresh adopt to outbid Amit? Here is an interesting cousin which you can puzzle which you can try out with uh, uh, a group of people. Uh, but the basically the idea is that you have a group of people and you want to know the average age but you do not want anyone to reveal their age uh, to anyone else essentially. So how can we 
solve this problem. How can you compute the average without revising the age? So, you can imagine as a uh, lead to you that you will circulate a piece of paper in which everybody will write something and pass it on and then it will come back to the first person who will say okay this is what I have got. Shraddha knows that her dad knows that her plane has landed essentially. These kind of things are commonplace. So, let us look at the solution for our puzzle. What was the puzzle? The puzzle was that Albert and Bernard had got two numbers. Let us call them A and B respectively. And first Albert says I do not know, which means what? It means that A is not equal to 0 because otherwise he would know whose number was larger. Therefore, A is either 1 or more than 1. And because B Albert has said I do not know, Bernard also knows this. Bernard says I do not know either. This implies that B must be greater than or equal to 2 because if B was 0 or 1, then Bernard would know that Albert has the larger number. And now Albert knows this that B's number should be 2 or more. Albert says even though you say this, I still do not know. So, you should think about this and figure out that this means that A should be greater than or equal to 3. Now, suddenly Bernard says, aha, now I know which of us has a larger number. So, the meaning of this is that Bernard must be holding 2 or 3 and Albert has a larger number essentially. So, we already know that B's number is greater than or equal to 2 and A's number is greater than or equal to 3. Albert says in that case I know both the numbers and implies A must be 3 and Albert, Albert knows that B is 2 essentially. And Bernard says and now I also know both the numbers. So, Bernard knows that A is 3. So, these are the kind of puzzles which deal with reasoning about what other people know and making inferences from there and so on. Let me give you one puzzle as a take home exam and it says follows that let us say it is 1968 before most of you were born and you are having tea with two world bridge champions Benito Garazzo and Giorgio Belladonna. When your friend Godbole walks in and says, I have three caps from a collection of red and black caps. He holds aloft a box from which a red cap falls down. He hastily puts it back in the box. So, everybody knows that there is a red box, red, red cap. Then he blindfolds all of you and places a cap on each head essentially. The blindfold is removed and you see two red caps on Galazzo and Belladonna's head. Now, one by one Godbole is going to ask you, do you know the color of the cap on your head essentially. So, what is the situation? You know that there was at least one red cap. You also know that you can see two red caps because both Galazzo and Belladonna have red caps each. And now, Godbole is asking the questions one by one. First, he goes to Galazzo and Benito says, no, I do not know the color of my cap. Then he goes to Belladonna and he also says that no, I do not know the color of my cap. And now he is going to come to you and what is your answer going to be and why. Okay, so we have seen a couple of puzzles and let us now look into this mechanism of epistemic logic and reasoning. It is reasoning about knowledge, it is reasoning about what other people know or other agents know and making inferences from there. It is primarily used in situations involving groups of agents, often used to model distributed systems. What does a given agent know about the world essentially? And more importantly, the higher order knowledge as to what does a given agent know about what other agents know essentially. So, A knows that B knows that B's number was greater than or equal to 2 
and this kind of sentences no we want to be able to reason with so let's quickly look at the language and uh, then uh, we will look at the details as we go so like any language it's a set of sentences and uh, the sentences in this epistemic language the simple epistemic language is atomic propositions so p as you see on the left hand side then for any formula from the language you can take the negation of the formula which is the second thing here for any two formulas you can take the conjunction of the two formulas now you would recall that if you have taken negation and conjunction these two logical connectives are enough to model everything else so even if you want to model things like implication and disjunction and so on you can always translate them into this essentially what is new in epistemic logic is this modal operator called ka so k is the modal operator which stands for knowledge and a is the name of the agent it stands for an agent it says that agent a knows some formula the formula can itself be a formula of epistemic logic so the unique unary epistemic operator ka is similar to the belief operator we saw belief in auto epistemic reasoning though we did not talk about agents at that time the main difference between the belief operator and the and the knowledge operator is that the knowledge operator ka is applicable only to true statements so that is the difference between the two while the belief operator does not require the believed statement to be necessarily true so this property of the knowledge operator is captured in this axiom t as it is called which stands for truth essentially and it says that if an agent a knows a formula phi then that phi better be true in the world whereas with belief operators that is not the necessary condition you can believe anything and there is nothing wrong in that essentially so let's look at uh, the axioms that this logic works with and there is like many logics this is also a family of logics and we look at this common nomenclature due to lemon and later by bull and sagan sagerberg so here are these set of axioms each has a letter name to it so the first axiom is the k axiom and what does it say it says that if an agent c knows that a implies a prime this arrow stands for implies here then if agent c knows a then agent c knows a prime what does this mean it means that the agent c can do modus ponens it knows a it knows a implies a prime and therefore it knows a prime this d is the double negation here so if agent c knows a it means that it's not the case that agent c knows not a essentially then the truth axiom that we saw a little while ago that if agent c knows a then a should be true truth or verid veridicality axiom then we have the positive and the negative in introspection that we saw in auto epistemic logic as well that if agent c believes in a or agent c knows a then agency knows that agency knows a essentially so it knows this likewise if the agency does not know a it knows that it does not know a essentially and then there are a couple of more uh, axioms that you can look at it and the commonly used set of axioms are known with system names so system k uses only the knowledge axiom system t uses both the truth axiom and the knowledge axiom system s which is the most common also uses the positive and negative introspection axioms and then we have systems like s point 
system uh, 5.2, 5.3 and 5.4. So this, this will take a little bit of time to digest, so I suggest that you look at that. Let us look at the last one, it says that if A is true, it means that what does this say that it is not the case that agent C knows A and then this second negation says that it is not the case that it is not the case that agent C knows A, this basically means that agent C knows a essentially. Okay, so you can think about the other two these things as well. The way to model or to may the way to talk about semantics of epistemic logics is the possible world semantics, but uh, I think we should do that in the uh, next session. Yes.